this is the 16th year of IPTED, and congratulations for the program that has grown to be the premier evaluation training program globally. Uh, congratulations to all of you who have made it here. You, I'm sure, will find this a life-changing experience. Um, and I'm sure that uh, the skills that you acquire and the networks that you build will most certainly assist you as you move forward. I'm very happy to be here again and to share some thoughts with you on evaluation and in the two hats that I will talk from, one as an evaluator myself and secondly as a manager of an independent evaluation office. So there's various themes that I will uh, cross through, but uh, keep it short in order to respond to some questions that you, you may have. Um, I've titled my presentation today, Evaluation from Professionals, that's you, Upholding the Bedrocks of Ethics, Independence and Credibility Towards Evaluation for Transformation. That's what I view evaluation as being and why it is so significant and important. And to start off as a backdrop, the unspoken, the evaluation ethics issue. Evaluation must hold the line on many fronts to be independent, to be credible, and also to promote and to be used. Of critical importance is that evaluation delivers judgment about quality. It is often formally and informally contested. You know that when you are in the, in, in the practice. Secondly, there are three Ps that need to be strong. Your policy, your process, and people are needed to remain ethical. If you are not supported by strong policy, by strong process, which is credible and transparent, and by people that believe in the virtues of independence and ethical behavior, you are going to have a problem. And thirdly, the professionalization of evaluation is critical. It needs a credible methodology within a context of sound evaluation policy and leadership. And I return to the issue of credible methodology. What you are experiencing at IPTED and in your work is to ensure that you remove the area which could be your Achilles heels in your work. When they do not like the result, they shoot the methodology. And it's important to be on sound methodological ground. The other ele elements of policy and leadership obviously are also important. But my first point about delivers judgment about quality I make the statement in a context where many heads who may not like independent evaluation use the argument, well, it's about learning. It can be about learning and accountability. And through accountability, you can learn. And a critical issue is whether the focus is internal for validation or external for judgment and to support the citizens. Now, I also argue that the bedrocks, which we take for granted, are actually contested in a very subtle way, but most certainly contested. They, always, they get redefined in operation and context. Ethical issues loom large in the evaluation process because you are making a judgment and people are contesting your judgment. There is the issue of the learning versus accountability rather than and accountability. Internal or and external objectives. So a function that is accountable can meet both purposes of internal learning and external accountability. But it's a, um, it's a process, and it has to be very clearly defined. So all the work you do would always come up into this issue is who is your client? Who are you serving? Who is your master? There's also pushback arguments that come through. There's the loyalty argument. If a result is critical, it's going to destroy the organization. There is the issue of the power and process dynamics. Depending on where you sit and where you're located gives you the power or the lack of power to talk, talk truth to power. And evaluation must ascribe judgment about past to cause correct. We make a judgment about a program whether it's worked or not. We need to do so. We need to look at the history so that we have a basis on which to look ahead. And that's really the backdrop in terms of the professionalization which I'd like you to reflect on. I now get specifically to the work of the office that I'm very proud to head, the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP. We take a professional approach. We have a significant role in the UN Evaluation Group, which is our professional association. 
Our key outputs are towards accountability and learning in all accounts, and we take very seriously global engagement. In terms of the UNDP and the United Nations, the UNDP is the largest development agency in the UN, with more than 170 countries present. It also has a role in the coordination of the UN agencies at country level. So in every country, when there's 20 agencies, UNDP coordinates it. The ResRep function, it's significant. It has 50 years in operation, it's large, it has a complex mandate, and it spends about $7 billion a year, coming from both core and non-core contributions, core being traditional donors, non-core being the program countries. It has a plethora of, of uh, activity. And this office is overseen by an executive board to which the IEO reports directly to and is accountable to protect the independence. The office, who evaluates the evaluators? Certainly it cannot be management. It cannot be the evaluant. That's a basic. So you have an audit and evaluation advisory committee called the AEAC, which oversees three key pillars of accountability. The evaluation, independent evaluation office, the Office of Audit and Investigations and Ethics, and we report to them on the program basis. And these are professionals that have come in and work on a voluntary basis, providing advice up to the various levels. Operationally, our work is advised by an International Evaluation Advisory Committee. Ray is a member of it, and there's others who are there, who look at each piece of evaluation and provide advice to the director process, methodology, etc. So in other words, we expand our intellectual capacity by bringing in this gravitas of experience that exists around the world. The board oversees the IEO work plan and budget, and the director takes final decision on evaluations and operations. All evaluations are signed in name. And it conducts independent evaluations and presents the annual report on evaluation, which is the critical oversight report. Now, how does it fit into the overarching UNDP? Reports to the board, that's the structural independence. It presents country-level evaluation to the government and stakeholders, and to date, 100 have been covered across the globe. We do, on average, about 10 per year. So when a country-level evaluation is completed, which ranges in value from 25 to two or $300 million, we present it directly to government, stakeholders, partners, donors, media, directly, and get their feedback. And that becomes the basis of the new country program. We work with international evaluation community. We also host UNEG. It's a member of the OECD DAC, and these are where we meet other professionals to look at the issue of methodology. And of course, an element that we have been doing, which is very successful and popular, is to organize the National Evaluation Capacity Series, where we work with government in order to help them facilitate their own learning so they build up the evaluative capacity. And there was a huge event last year in, in Bangkok, and there's an event that's coming up. So each evaluation, you see it on your screen, is presented, signed off, and the management response is within the evaluation. And the evaluations are written in the relevant language. So I have colleagues who are sitting uh, over here, one and Decker. One is, Decker is going to be in Jordan, and one has come back from Kyrgyzstan. So on the field, throughout the process, we watch it. And this is very, very critical. You really get to know a country when you do an evaluation. And of course, we take a pride in our products. Evaluation country level, we've done 100. There's a, and we'll never cover the globe. We can only do so many. We do thematics. We look at the regional and global, and we also have done joint and impact evaluation. So with the Global Environmental Facility, all the work on environment, I have conducted it with, uh, jointly with that, with that office. And we present to our board, and they present to their Jeff Council. It's significant. Joint evaluations are not easy, but they are necessary, because it helps to bring issues together. We have the National Evaluation Capacity Proceedings, the annual report on evaluation, which is presented directly to the president of the board, is the summation of the work that we do as an accountability document for the money that is allocated. And we've moved to the area of, as you'll see on the website, illustrated summaries and even video clips. Because the thick, heavy report is likely not to be read by everyone. So you need to really be able to distill your findings in a way that becomes accessible. 
A little about dissemination channels. The big report is important, but if you want your, to gain transparency and you want your work to be known, you need to have a very strong communication outreach element. And taking into account modern technology and media, we have revamped in the last few years the website, we have newsletters, social media, a new evaluation resource center. We take seriously stakeholder engagements and of course conferences, and you could see the statistics and data going up each year. As the world gets to know more about evaluation, they read about it. So the messages that need to be put out are messages that they can digest and to write in a way that is very, very accessible. I come now to our roles, our responsibilities, and obligations. And this links to the methodological question. Independence does not mean isolation. It means principled engagement. And at the end, an ability to make the call in terms of a judgment. If it is isolation, you'd be so isolated, you'd not have an impact. If you over-engage, you'll be so deep in the water, you'd not see the shoreline. So full engagement with the evaluant is worked out in terms of the concept note, the terms of reference, the draft report, the final report. We conduct evaluations at the corporate level, uh, process mapping, verbal sharing, so there's got to be a lot of engagement. All evaluations at UNDP now have a management response in the evaluation right up front. And that's giving respect to the evaluant because people that read the report quickly generally read the executive summary. What was found and what is management doing about it? And the timelines are there. But it's also critical that the evaluations are quality controlled. And we've had the evaluation advisory panel, we have peer reviews, the OECD DAC peer review has been extremely useful. Uh, one was done on the office when I joined, which pointed out areas of weakness. Who evaluates the evaluator? Certainly management cannot do it. So getting a group of peers to come in and, and pass judgment most certainly helps. And UNEG has taken that element quite uh, far. And of course, to respect the right, the evaluant right to respond and publish. So just as much we do not expect our reports to be changed. If the evaluant decides to disagree with the recommendation, that is fine. And it should be put into the public domain. This is not a negotiation. And we have had disagreements where they have a different perspectives. That must be respected, and it must be put into the, in, into the report. The moment you move into the area of trying to negotiate language, you are actually in very thin ice at the ethical level. IEO in UNEG, the United Nations Evaluation Group, started some time ago by my predecessor. We host the Secretariat. It's an interagency professional network that brings together the evaluation units of the UN system and consists of 46 members around the world. We just had a meeting in Geneva and we've adopted the new UNEG norms and standards that have entrenched issues of credibility, independence, utility, budget. It'll be launched in the next two weeks. It's come a long way. Uh, we serve as a vice chair of the system-wide initiatives such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the peer review last year, professionalization, norms and standards. And again, the word professionalization, trying to get an occupational class for UN staff called evaluators is important. So there's an identity and also allows for persons to move between agencies. And that's a challenge, but it's something we need to look at. To global engagement. Um, National Evaluation Capacity Conferences started from Morocco, went to South Africa, to Brazil, and a huge event in Thailand, the largest, over 100 countries. A conversation about how do you blend evaluation principles, independence, credibility, utility, with practice, what the people think, in order to bring about development. And we had fascinating insights and discussions that came through from that. And that is really about evaluating the MDGs towards the SDGs. There's a lot of capacity around the world, a lot of thinking on the subject, and as evaluators we can help this thinking. You had a Bangkok declaration, we had training at the NEC event, just like a classic evaluation conference for the first time, uh, proper workshops, colleagues here contributed, and of course contribute to the SDGs and evaluation. And coming back to key outputs, remain accountability and learning. Learning is an output. 
The accountability are largely the evaluations. Sharing knowledge, the NEC conferences, the UNEC publications, evaluation products, publications, summaries, videos, and a repository, the 3,500 evaluations on the repository, which are searchable, so anyone can go in and look at them. These are the ones that are conducted at the country level. We do not attest to the quality, but they are there in the public domain for people to look at, because many would be for information. All evaluations, all assessments are not necessarily the full-blown accountability. And I say that both are attainable and not exclusive. That argument, well, you either have learning or you have accountability, and either or, I disagree with it strongly. I think it's a pushback argument. It's a way to actually uh, challenge a, a key principle of evaluation. For professionals, what you need, what you're getting, your competencies and your dispositions, the ability to deal with the subject of judgment in an organization is not easy. How do you communicate evaluation findings in a way in which it is constructive so that it, it moves matters forward rather than becomes he said, she said, we disagree? There's always going to be that uh, thing. And with experience, it helps. We talk about evaluation as a democratic pursuit and transformation stimuli. When you go in as evaluators, you switch on the lights. You focus attention. Hard questions are asked. So what has this achieved? You are likely to get a lot of input about busyness, activities. And the key issue is, so what? Accountability and judgment and learning through principled engagement. You will have to engage with the evaluant throughout the process as many times as possible. Provided it's principled engagement, it's on the table, it's open, it's transparent. It's not a negotiation in terms of text and language. And responses to evaluation counts. Multiple forums and media, we said, they said. UNDP is fortunate. It has a very high response to evaluations, 86%. And when we look at the next evaluation, we look at what the previous evaluation found. So, for example, in the gender evaluation, we looked at the previous gender evaluation, and we found that they had done all that the previous evaluation suggested. That's good. So, as long as the organization is learning and taking things forward, it's important, it's significant. But, of course, the percentage is not the only figure. What's important is the quality of, evaluate, uh, of recommendations. If it's low quality, you're going to get a high uptake because they're easy to do. And you've got to be very careful in how you couch and write the recommendations. A few thoughts on your professionalization. You have a chosen profession and a great responsibility to, to talk truth to power through expertise and constructive dialogue. Communication is not only the report. It must be throughout the process. Part of the challenges the evaluators get is they meet in the first instance and the evaluator never sees them and then they come in the end and then they're shocked. You've got to go through a process of engagement so that you are able to take people on board. The evaluant, do not assume that the evaluant does not know how the program works. And it's quite easy when you're on the other end to have this great knowledge. That's your job to think, but also understand the context within which you're evaluating. Because if it is A, contextual, A, historical, you'll find it very difficult. Your, your, your recommendations become up in the air. It becomes difficult. You need to direct them. I mentioned this above, uh, uh, before in terms of independence not being isolation. Finally, some, some messages for you as an, as an IPTED cohort. Your work is potentially transformational, certainly democratic, and despite difficulty, it's a worthy pursuit. You've chosen this profession. Ask who you serve at an intermediate level, at an intermediate and ultimate level, internal or external. Be clear about that. Learning is possible through accountability evaluation, which negates the argument of learning versus accountability. Do not assume that your assumptions are universal. Listen carefully. Now, communities of practice like the IPTED family most certainly helps. And finally, go forth and evaluate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Chitra Deshpande, and I'm from IFAD. 
Uh, I, I very much appreciated your presentation. Uh, I'm taking a course uh, on with Michael Patton on uh, developmental evaluation. So, and part of that is a methodology of participant observation, being part of the implementation. And I wondered in your presentation about the independence of the evaluator, how, how, your views on that. When you talk, sorry, about participant observation, the evaluant is participating in the process? Correct. Okay. <coughs> sure. I'll take a few questions. Richard had a question sure. here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you indicated that within the UN system you're thinking of a specific occupational class of an evaluator. Uh, this is an issue that is debated uh, globally at the moment, and I was wondering in terms of the detail of your discussion, if you're looking at accreditation in terms of particular credential qualification, or if you're looking at trying to identify competencies, define the sets of competencies, and um, sort of apply those in your selection of uh, candidates to that specific uh, occupational class. Um, so I was just wondering what UNEG was thinking about those uh, critical approaches to developing professional evaluators. Thank you. So, okay. One question on um, how UNDP is managing um, kind of a trickling down of evaluation knowledge down to the field level, um, basically trying to strengthen you know, program management and program planning and implement, uh, for, uh, for evaluation. Sure, I'll take these three. Um, definitely do not profess to know the answers of all. Uh, I'll start with the, first, uh, the second question by Professor Levine, the one on accreditation. This has a strong, been a strong debate in the UNEG community. We are not advocating as a UNEG community, and we all are members of the 46 agencies, for an accreditation system where it will become exclusionary, where unless you are certified, it becomes a problem for you to practice. Two reasons for this. One, the diversity of the UN is such that it's very difficult to get a classic set of skills for this. The second issue, the evaluation profession is still developing in the UN system. And if you move too quickly to a accreditation, it can lead to exclusion. So what we are, have done, and we will continue to do, is to recruit evaluators on the basis of competencies. So on the website of UNEG, you'll find evaluator competencies for the various levels uh, early evaluators, middle managers, etc. And those competencies then become the basis on which we recruit. So any evaluator who is in, they have the classic terminology still and they call different things in different offices. Mine they call evaluation advisors, in other places they call something else. Um, that means that you have got into the system. We do that on the understanding that the, more di the greater diversity there is in the evaluant and in the community, the more difficult it is. However, we are thinking very clearly, and we've just come out with a paper on professionalization, it is on the UNEG website, of making it moving in the direction of some form of certification that gives a greater amount of confidence in this. But it's a debate that's been going on for a few years in UNEG, and I invite you to read the paper. It's got all the debates and, and challenges in it. We would view participants that have, uh, evaluators that have come into a course like IPTED as having the relevant certification and accreditation. They have the exposure, they're ready to practice. We would be cautious about someone who says, well, the reason we, you need to take me seriously is because I've got 30 years in, the, in practice, although I've never attended an evaluation conference, read a journal or anything of the sort. That group we would have a problem with because the profession is changing quite fast. Um, the last question on UNDP, knowledge to the field. Those 3,500 evaluations that I spoke about, most are from the country level. 
and that's in the public dom uh, domain and repository, and we would hope that there's a reading and assimilation that takes place on it. Uh, but I don't know how far it's gone. The production of evaluative knowledge does not equate the, equa uh, the assimilation of it, and uh, it's another element that still has to be looked at. We would be looking at it. And the first question in terms of a methodological question, uh, participants observing in an evaluation process, it depends on the evaluation question. Um, if you are doing a certain type of evaluation, I'm sure it is totally uh, uh, you know, useful in, the, in that regard. The evaluations that uh, my office conducts, we do not have the participants, the evaluant observing, because we need the information without the dynamic of another person being there so that we can get it, whether it's a corporate headquarter evaluation or country level evaluation. So quite often we tell the, the, the staff, please let us talk to the people directly, and that's you know, pretty much in it. But I'm sure in the context that you are talking, it possibly you know, could, could work. Um, and I think there's many types of evaluation. There's very, you know, various methodologies. In some of the evaluations we conduct, we engage a lot more with the evaluant. In others, we engage a lot less for good reasons. So it's the subject and the topic. Okay. Sure. I just wanted, I, I accept your answer, so, but in your, in terms of being the participant observer and if you're involved, what, what uh, is it that you would need to keep in mind to ensure your independence and your ethical positioning, or do you see no issue in that? I got clear views on independence. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think that's pretty much, much known. I think blurring the lines can cause a problem. Uh, it leads to negotiation. I think it's quite fine to have results coming from different sides and a, a thorough and, and, and a strong debate on it. Um, and it's informed by the fact that the office that I head reports directly to the executive board. They expect a result of how it worked and they want to know how it's going to move ahead. There are other offices, evaluation offices in the U UN system who take a much more participatory, engaged approach with management. They do not report to the board. They report to management. It's a more facilitative uh, type of process. Nothing wrong with it, but that's how it is pitched. Yeah, the structure of this office is different. The dynamic is different, and I think it's totally fine. It's what the policy dictates. It's what the board wants. It's accountability for the, the, the funding. Hello, my name is Felix Herzog. I work for the UN Secretariat in Beirut, Regional Commission, and I would be interested to know how much of your budget is uh, dedicated to the dissemination. We've been talking a lot about there's not dissemination, there's no purpose of doing reports, etc. And how do you justify that to management? I'm not in your case, but what are your, uh, uh, yeah, how you balance that uh, and how you justify the money spent in dissemination? Indran, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm Maya Vijay Raghun from the Asian Development Bank. Um, I just had a question about joint evaluations. You did mention there are some challenges. Uh, so if you have any tips on pitfalls and how to overcome some of them, I think we may be getting increasingly involved in these joint evaluations. So anything you have to share with us that would help us with the process would be very helpful. That's the last. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, the first question in terms of dissemination cost. The, I consider stakeholder workshops or the debriefing process to be a key element of dissemination, more than the production of a glossy report. In fact, our actual cost of maintaining the, of maintaining the website printing is right down because of new technology. So that's really very, very negligible. The reason why we do invest in the debriefing, as we would call it, and spend a week almost in each country after we finish a country level evaluation, going back and talking to the various stakeholders individually of what we found before we come to the big workshop, is that despite spending months 
five, six months in the field, you still can get it wrong. And when you present the, uh, the, the, you know, the findings, there's new information that comes. It, it constantly changes on that. The cost is quite negligible in the overall budget. I, we have managed, despite the increase in number of evaluations in, the, in, in my office, to keep the cost low and even reduce the unit cost of evaluations, changing methodology and, and working on processes that are, that are much better. The independent evaluation office has a budget of 0.2% of corporate. It's in the, in the policy, it's 1% of, of the overall. And it's a cost that is totally justifiable because with all the work that one does for many months, if it's not getting out there and read, what is the point? So, but it's, a, it's generally the smallest cost uh, in, 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 the, in the overall uh, you know, element. Um, and social media has really reduced the, the cost. All our uh, video clips in terms of the, uh, the quick to read thing, it's all done internally at no cost. It's staff who are on basically salary here. The question from ADB, it's a challenge, joint evaluations. And we have many requests that come through from the board. Just go ahead, do joint evaluations. going to sort the problem out. It's extremely difficult, putting it mildly. Uh, one element that helps is if the heads of the offices get on well, which worked in my case with the Global Environmental Facility, the independent evaluation offices worked. But when you get to the operational level, the staff view issues differently. They also view data differently. And the real challenge comes about, not so much at that point, is the analysis. So you can have two independent evaluation officers who purportedly work with the same norms and standards, but how it's viewed and how it's, it comes through can be quite a challenge on that. It tends to take long. It's not necessarily cheaper. It can be a lot more complex. But most certainly, whether we like it or not, the boards want it. They don't want to be receiving six evaluations from agencies that are related. And it's an area that we need to get in. We have produced some guidelines in UNEG on joint evaluations, how to do it. We have learned in actually doing it, that's all theoretical. When you really get down to it, you'll realize it'll always take longer than you plan, and it'll always be more contested than you think. Uh, we managed to pull them out on the small grants program, um, and we were happy in the end. But through the process, it was very challenging. That. So um, it's an area to look at. Thank you very much for this question. Well, I think we uh, have had a really thoughtful, carefully constructed presentation here this noon. This man's very thoughtful, very smart. He's, a, he's very wise. And he, he knows how to negotiate change and processes inside a rather Byzantine uh, set of bureaucracies. The UN system is not transparent. The UN system is not clear anything but. And midst all that fog and all that smoke and mirrors, this man steers his agency in a very thoughtful and successful way. And they produce good work. If you, they've just done a, a big study on gender in the, uh, the UN system that is, is really quite exceptional. They also have a, a very thoughtful report that's just released on how the UN system is handling mine action in particular the demining situations that are showing up for us sadly all over the world. And they have done really a very thorough report on the issue of how the UN is handling demining. In any event, Inder, thank you. You're a good guy. You really a good guy. We have a small presentation for you. Now I know the UN has got a ceiling yes. on the, <laughs> yes. the amount of such gifts. This is at least one penny below the ceiling. Okay, so we'd like to give it to you. This is the 2016 paperweight. IPDET paperweight. Thank you very much. He's got a number of them now. All right. <laughs>